course, Eastern Philosophy from Confucius to Yogananda. This is my second course on Eastern Philosophy as I got a lot of positive feedback from the first one. People said they wanted even more content. And there's just so much to cover in a course on philosophy that's as vast as, you know, covering the whole entire Eastern region of the world. All these different cultures and different countries have slightly different backgrounds and different uh, histories and everything like that. So I left out Confucius almost completely from my first course in Eastern philosophy, which of course is difficult to do since so much of Asian and Eastern culture is based on Confucius's ideas. So in this course, I focus on Confucius and we're gonna learn about um, a lot of other Indian philosophers such as Swami Yogananda, who was made very famous by Steve Jobs. He had um, Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, on his iPhone when he died. It was the only book that he had. And uh, Yogananda became a big ambassador for, for yoga in uh, the West. So he brought a lot of these ideas initially over in the early 1900s, 1920s to the West and had a huge, huge impact on introducing it to uh, America and Europe and places like that. So in this course, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to cover Confucius. We're going to cover all these different thinkers and what they had to teach us. My approach to teaching philosophy is I don't want to use a lot of jargon. I don't want it to be something that is super boring and super theoretical and follows a lot of you know syllogisms and logic puzzles and Aristotelian sort of things. I want it to be something that is applicable, something that is practical, pra practical that will help us in our everyday lives. And that's one of the reasons why I'm drawn to Eastern philosophy in general. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, these are very practical philosophies. I mean, they're religions in one sense, but they're philosophies in another sense. They're teachings that are supposed to make us happier, healthier, better human beings. And it's not that Western philosophy doesn't necessarily also do that. I just find Eastern philosophy in particular to be very, very useful in our everyday lives. And an interesting thing that I talk about throughout the course is that there's a lot of parallels between Eastern philosophy or Eastern religion and Western philosophies and religions as well. I find that to be very interesting when the, the two modes of thought overlap, as it were. It kind of tells you that there must be something there when people from different times in history, different parts of the world, people who are considered to be the wisest, greatest teachers are basically telling us some of the same things. I think there's, there must be something to it in that case, right? So one of the things that uh, Confucius says is that it is better to light one small candle than to curse the darkness. This is a really familiar quote that you've probably heard in many iterations of from different people. I think it's interesting that Confucius, maybe he was the first one then that said this. Basically, light your candle in the darkness. Don't be worried that you can't, you know, change the whole world, that you can't stop all these evil things from happening. It's better instead of complaining and saying, oh, there's too much, you know, evil in the world, I can't do anything. Just light your candle instead of complaining, instead of cursing the darkness. At least you can do a little bit of good in one small part of the world. So that's one of the Confucius's quotes that I like. I'm going to be using a lot of quotes throughout the course. I think it's very efficient. It boils down what a lot of these teachers thought. A lot of the stuff that they, they taught, instead of reading their 500-page treaty on some idea, we can just look at small bits, the most concise parts of what they taught. I think quotations give us a lot of the meat of these philosophies and we can cover a lot more ground by looking at it from this point of view. I studied philosophy at university, but most of my reading and my learning has been as an adult reading philosophy every day, Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, studying all the religions. And one thing that I know turns people off from philosophy is that they think it's complicated or it's boring and things like that. So I don't use a lot of jargon. I'm trying to get as much out of these teachings and, and these philosophers as I can. So I just kind of have a brief overview here about Eastern philosophy. And it's interesting that most of it originated a long, long time ago, the fifth and sixth century BC before the common era or before Christ. I mean, Confucianism, Buddhism, the advent of Hinduism as we know it, today, all right around the same time, the 5th and 6th century BCE. Also interesting, Sufism and um, the Muslim religion actually came much, much later. A lot of people don't realize that it was like the 6th and 7th centuries when you had um, the Sufi Muslim tradition 
um, and you had Muhammad uh, doing his teachings and founding that religion. It was much, much later. So Eastern religion is very old, and it's interesting that across China and India, I mean, they were not sharing these ideas. Confucianism and Buddhism, they did not interact with each other. They were separate, but they have a lot of really similar insights and similar teachings. Now, you can chalk it up to have them having similar cultures, but I think it's very interesting that um, places that are far away, especially back then, they're really far away from each other, and in some cases in, in time, too, came to a lot of similar conclusions. Yoga isn't so much a religion, you know, like Buddhism is. Yoga was more of a, a spiritual system that sort of uh, encapsulates the ancient Indian culture, and it goes all the way back to this Vedic period in the 1500 BCE, all up to 600 BCE. This was well, these books or these writings called the Vedas were written, and a lot of the yoga philosophy has come from from that. I'm not going to get too much into the history because again, I don't want it to be too dry or too boring. But it is pretty interesting to see the origins of some of these uh, philosophies. And so later on, someone that we're going to study in the course named Patanjali, he uh, translated and made popular a lot of the information in the Vedas. And then even later than Patanjali, someone named Swami Vivekananda who uh, has a big section in this course, he uh, once again popularized those old ideas. So we had these different teachers bringing these old teachings back again and again throughout time. And of course, we find that in the 21st century, they're more relevant than, than ever. In our stressful, fast-paced lives, these old philosophies and ways of thinking are very, very useful, and they can help us learn to be healthier and calmer and um, ultimately um, have happier lives. So just in brief, we're going to look at yoga in general. It's not a religion. A lot of people, of course, think of yoga as just being the um, body uh, movements, the postures, and the exercise, which has become very, very popular these days in the West as an exercise. That's only one side of yoga. It's only one aspect of yoga. And originally, yoga was seen as an exercise that was useful because it allowed people to sit longer. In meditation. So if you were really good at yoga, you would be comfortable to, to meditate maybe all day long. Otherwise, it would be really uncomfortable for you to sit in one spot, in one position for all day. So that's actually the reason why yoga even started. It was a way for you to be able to meditate better and longer. And so in this section, we're going to look at yoga, and we're going to look at Patanjali, who had a huge influence on taking the yoga from the Vedas and turning it into something that's akin to a religion, something that was very popular. This was even a couple thousand years ago. Patanjali is really old, and then later on it's been reintroduced over and over again, as I said. So it's not a religion, but it's really, really closely linked to Hinduism and Indian culture in general. So a lot of times when people think of yoga, they may think of Hinduism and vice versa, but then they're not the same thing. Because Hinduism is a religion, but they have a lot of similarities, let's just say. And Confucius, of course, he originated in China, but um, Confucianism still drives culture throughout Asia. And I know that if you're Asian or Asian American or something listening to this, the first thing you might be thinking of, well, actually, all cultures are different. I mean, I personally, I live in Vietnam. I know that the Vietnamese culture not only is different than the Chinese culture or Japanese culture, but it's different from some of the other cultures in Southeast Asia. However, Confucianism has had a huge impact on all of Asia. It was considered to be, you know, China was considered to be a cultural hearth as we say in the historical dialect, and it influenced all of the smaller countries around it. And so Confucius is just this major figure. A lot of the, the aspects of society today, like the patriarchal nature of society you know, that favors males, that goes all the way back to Confucius. A lot of the formality and emphasis on ritual, that goes back to Confucius. The emphasis on you know, the family being like the primary unit of society or the glue of society, that's a Confucius, Confucian idea. So Confucius was an ancient Chinese teacher scholar, but his impact has, is still being felt throughout Asia today. Krishnamurti is a really interesting character because he was basically hailed as this, the next coming, you know, this, this divine spiritual leader of this sect in India. And he had this church, basically. He was chosen to be the leader while he was a child, not dissimilar from how the Dalai Lama is chosen um, to be the leader. They, they choose a baby, they say, is the incarnation of the past Dalai Lama. But it's interesting because he rejected that. As he got older, he rejected his position. He renounced it. He renounced 
all property and everything. And he would ended up rejecting all authority and all conformity, basically, as a form of enslavement. So Krishnamurti is really interesting. He's very different than a lot of other thinkers and philosophers, but he still came out of the Indian tradition. He still has a lot of sort of yoga slash Hinduist um, ideas, I think. And so he's really interesting to study. So um, if you've never heard of Krishnamurti, as a lot of people haven't, he's got a lot to... Um, a lot of stuff that will give us a lot of food for thought, let's say. Okay, so we're going to look at him. Vivekananda, I already mentioned, is kind of the guy who brought Patanjali's writings and translations of the Vedas back. He was around in the 18th century, so much more recent. I mean, Krishnamurti, was, he died in 1984 or something like that. So he um, was active during the early and mid part of the 20th century. Vivekananda was the 18th century. He popularized yoga and made Patanjali's writings well known. He has a lot of really good quotes and things that he said. And then finally we're going to look at Swami Yogananda who um, wrote the famous book, as I already mentioned, the autobiography of a yogi. And he um, popularized yoga and Hinduism in the West at a time and it was considered to be, it was very, very little known. It was considered to be some, some weird, you know, barbaric um, religion or something. And he came to the U.S. and was very popular. He was a big hit, became famous, and um, he spread these ideas a lot. And then later on, I think he paved the way for people to come in the 1950s and 60s and, and teach Zen and um, influence our culture even more later as well. I have a quote here from Patanjali. He said, a mind free from all disturbances is yoga. So very simple definition. Basically, whatever frees your mind from disturbances, whatever gives you peace, um, that's yoga. So of course, meditation has a huge part to play in yoga. You can think of yoga as being one part body, one part mind. And um, we're going to look at that and dissect what yoga is and what it isn't in the next lesson.